All right, so good uh, morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you are stuck at home, so we so appreciate you tuning in on YouTube as we continue to highlight epic scientists and explorers from across the globe. We are also joined live today by two teachers, uh, Mr. Dupuy in Lafayette, Louisiana, and Ms. Fairweather in Victoria, BC. So a huge uh, thanks to them for joining us today in our program. Of course, the reason we are all here today is for our speakers. So. Dr. Erica Caden has joined us a number of times, I think 10 times. In fact, both Joe and I from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants have had the chance to go down into her amazing research facility to, to interact with her and do programs live from there. But you will know her as a research scientist at Snow Lab. So this is one of the elite research facilities in the world studying the mysteries of the universe from two kilometers down beneath the earth in a working nickel mine. So we're going to find out why people would go so far down to understand things about our deep universe. And we're going to learn from Dr. Caden a little bit about the amazing work that she does. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today at home, but with a bit of a cool background tour. Um, Dr. Caden, thanks so much. Hey, Jesse, it's great to be here again and great to talk to you from uh, from home or slash from Snow Lab here. So if we were in the mine, when you're walking into work, when I walk into work to go underground, this is what I see, what is behind me. This is uh, the first area that you get to after you have gone two kilometers underground and after you've walked a kilometer and a half through the active mine, talking with the miners and our other coworkers, this is what's called the, uh, the double track area. This is where everything comes into the lab. Um, before we actually get inside. So when I've done presentations before, I've been in the lab and in my whole clean room getup that I'll show you in some pictures. Um, so we don't ever get to see this in our presentation. So it's, it's kind of cool. I have a bunch of different backgrounds from the lab that we'll be able to show. So you can, I'm gonna try and take you on a virtual tour of the lab through Zoom. Uh, but first I'm gonna show a bit of a presentation. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, is this good? Perfect, looks great. Awesome. So uh, this is what I look like normally when I'm giving Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants presentations. Uh, we are, Snow Lab is a clean lab, a uh, class 2000, which means there are fewer than 2000 particles of bigger than a micro, half a micron in size and a cubic foot. So I know those are some funny combining of units, but it means that we are clean, that we have to wear these clean coveralls, hair nets, hard hats, uh, gloves, depending on what we're doing, um, uh, and the whole facility. Clean is not just a, an adjective, it is a, a verb. We are constantly cleaning the equipment, the experiments, the walls, the floors, uh, the, whole, the whole facility. So here are just some pictures of me doing work, tuning electronics. Uh, this is actually a wrench that is used <laughs> to adjust some, some ropes that hold up the detector that I work on. And here I am helping to check uh, the, the um, integrity of the walls in the cavern around the snow detector, snow plus detector, that I'll show you some pictures of uh, in a minute. <clears throat> um, do I... Does this still work? Can you guys still see? Yep, you should be good. Awesome. Try the next okay. slide, there we go, perfect. <clears throat> Fantastic. So this is uh, what Snow Lab looks from the outside. Of course, it doesn't look like this anymore. We did have some snow over the weekend, uh, but this is, <laughs> uh, but now it's lovely spring in Northern Ontario. So you can see here, this is where we are, where the lab is located uh, on the purple pin. And this is just our surface building. So we have surface clean lab space, surface office space, um, but most of the, the fun stuff takes place underground. So we are located in Creighton Mine, which is an active nickel mine that's been uh, operating for over 100 years now. So there are uh, different pits and different shafts that go down to different depths. So we are located uh, off of nine shaft that goes down over 8,000 feet. Um, I'm sorry, they're mining past 8,000 feet. The, the shaft goes down to 7,200 and we walk, so we get straight down. The elevator ride takes three and a half minutes at full, full tilt. Uh, and then we walk another kilometer and a half to get to the lab. So if you could see the lab all in one, this is kind of what it looks like. 
um, it is a, originally it was just this area here for when the original snow experiment, experiment was running in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, but then the lab expanded and we built this entire facility over here for other science to happen, that we have this fantastic location in this ultra clean facility to do neutrino research and dark matter research. And many other experiments wanted to be to host their experiments here. So we were able to expand the lab uh, into this large facility, uh, which we have now. <clears throat> so the main focus of Snow Lab is to study neutrinos and dark matter. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as uh, buying these plushies from the particlezoo.net, but they are a nice representation of the particles that we are looking for. So we have neutrinos uh, on the left, anti-neutrinos on the right, and this mysterious dark matter that we haven't yet found, but we're doing our best to look for it. So mainly I work on the neutrino side of the lab. So neutrinos are fundamental particles uh, like electrons or quarks, and quarks are what make up protons and neutrons. Um, neutrinos come from the sun, they come from nuclear reactors, and they come from normal beta decays, very completely natural, not scary radioactivity that happens just naturally. When a nucleus is a little too heavy and it throws off a neutron, we, uh, um, or a, a neutron decays into a proton, we get a neutrino out of it. So we have many sources of neutrinos. They come from uh, different, uh, uh, different sources. They also come from cosmic rays and from supernova exploding. Um, and they can tell us about uh, the Earth. They can tell us about how they came from. So the, soup, the neutrinos that come from supernova, pictured on the bottom, uh, can tell us about how the process of the supernova exploding happens. We have seen one supernova in our lifetime uh, that we saw the neutrinos from, and that was in 1987. So we are really hoping for another one <clears throat> um, to be able to confirm a lot of the models and the neutrinos, to study the neutrinos that come from it, which can tell us about uh, the different explosion mechanisms. Um, we can study, use neutrinos to study the sun and to understand the fusion processes in the sun and how the heavier elements are formed. Uh, that's really exciting. And uh, that was really kind of what started to kick off a lot of neutrino research in the 1960s. But we can also use neutrinos to tell us about our own planet, the Earth. We know that the Earth is very warm, not just from the sun, but from its own radioactivity inside, from these beta decays, um, which produce neutrinos. So we can use neutrinos to study the interior of the Earth farther than we can drill down. <clears throat> the there have been a couple measurements made of these neutrinos at different locations in the world, one in Japan and one in Italy. So it's really interesting to measure the neutrinos coming from the crust in different locations around the Earth to try and understand uh, the internal composition even better. So the, ex uh, the experiment that I work on is called Snow Plus. This is a picture of the original snow detector as it was being constructed. So this is this is huge. While well, Jesse's visited the lab, he's never gotten this shot. Uh, the cavern is um, 30 meters tall by 27 meters wide at the widest part. It's a barrel shape, so kind of wider in the middle than at the top or bottom. The detector here is 18 meters across, and each little white dot that you see is a photo detector or a light sensor that uh, picks up tiny, tiny bits of light, single photons, and turns them into electronic signal that goes up through these, these black cables. So this, was this picture was taken during the original construction when it was filled with water uh, for the first phase of the Snow Plus detector. This is what it looked like. And this is actually uh, a photograph from cameras that we have installed to monitor the position of the detector because it's held up and down by these ropes um, to uh, hold it up in place and then to counteract the buoyant force from when it's filled not just with water, but a uh, chemical loaded uh, mineral oil that can uh, help us um, perform our ultimate goal of the experiment, which is to see if a neutrino is the same as an anti-neutrino, if, uh, if they are actually the, the same particle, and which is 
one of the really interesting things about neutrinos. So we can use them to study the earth, we can use them to study the sun, but they have their own really interesting properties, which is what scientists like me are looking for to understand what these particles are. They're the second most abundant particle in the universe after photons. And we still don't know much about them because they're very difficult to detect. So by building multiple big experiments, we can study their properties in different ways, which is uh, what, I, what I love to do. So this is a picture of our detector, again, which looks pretty much like the other picture that I showed you, except that you can see uh, a weird interface line kind of right around here, if you know what you're looking for. And this tells us that we are half filled with our, our liquid scintillator. So it looks a little bit lighter on top than it does on the bottom. And that's because the, the mineral oil has a different index of refraction, or it bends light at a different uh, speed than, or yeah, at a different angle, a different speed than the water in the bottom. So we can watch as the detector is filling with oil, which is very, very exciting if you're me. So there are some of the other experiments that we have at the lab that are searching for dark matter. Like I said, we're a neutrino lab, but we're also very much a dark matter lab now. On the left here, we have the deep 3600 detector that <clears throat> has been running uh, for many years, looking for a dark matter particle to bounce off a nucleus of liquid argon and produce a little bit of light. And we're on the right is the PICO detector which is currently in its commissioning phase about to turn on, which is looking for a dark matter particle to create a tiny bubble in, um, in a freon and uh, look for that bubble to expand. So we know that dark matter exists because we can see it, its effect on other light, on other galaxies. We can know that it holds galaxies together as they're spinning through space. We don't know what it is beyond that. We, there are many different theories of what dark matter could be, what the actual dark matter particle could be, um, but we don't have any conclusive uh, evidence yet from, from experiments of, of what it is. So we have many different detector technologies looking for, uh, looking for dark matter with many different uh, materials, again, different technologies, and many of them at Snow Lab. So here are just two experiments that use completely different ways of looking for dark matter. And they're, they're both uh, currently uh, in operation at Snow Lab or, or, um, or at, at Snow Lab, yes. <clears throat> so, but now the future, what we're looking for next year at Snow Lab, on the left, we have Super CDMS, which is under construction right now. Um, and of course, construction is a bit, uh, Construction, all the experiments is a bit put on hold now because uh, access to the lab is restricted. Um, but we're still keeping things going and keeping things maintaining. Um, and we're just keeping all of our employees safe. But Super CDMS is looking for dark matter to hit a germanium or a silicon crystal. And those crystals are kept at almost absolute zero, millikelvin. So they'll produce a little bit of scintillation light. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, ionization. Uh, uh, hold and we'll read that signal out. Um, but they are, you know, the coolest place in the universe. And on the right is one of the possible detectors that will go inside what's called the cryo pit or the last uh, unused cavern of this depth, uh, of this size at this depth in the world. We're just waiting for the down select to happen on what uh, the next uh, neutrinoless double beta decay experiment will be, and hopefully it will come to the cryo pit. So the, which is what we call this uh, this cavern. So this is an artist's rendering of what one experiment might look like in the cryo pit. This is called Nexo. And Nexo is also looking for if neutrinos and antineutrinos are the same thing. So there is uh, another small subset of the science we do at Snow Lab that looks at uh, genomics and uh, metabolomics of fruit flies and uh, low red activity environment to grow uh, cell lines to see how that affects our susceptibility to cancer. So by having this uh, amazing facility deep underground to do particle astrophysics, we've now uh, started to host the uh, other experiments in other scientific areas that can use the facility and the knowledge we have to conduct experiments in this kind of environment. So slight plug, you can find out more about what we do. Our Instagram is like on fire now during quarantine because we can't get in the lab to show you cool pictures, but we can show you 
what has been going on. Friday faces are my favorite. So that is what I have for what I've been doing. Um, and so I am, any questions about anything? <laughs> Well, before the questions, first of all, thank you so much for an awesome presentation highlighting, uh, you know, the rapid fire version of all the work you're doing. But I think you promised us a cool background tour of some of these cool places with your, your stuff. So I don't want to miss out on that. I can do that. Let's see how well this works. And our teachers uh, can think up questions and get them from their students in the meantime. <laughs> absolutely. So one experiment that I didn't talk about that we can go to now is the halo detector. <clears throat> so this is a dedicated supernova detector. Like I mentioned, supernova, they give off neutrinos. Um, and it's often experiments will uh, just be uh, searching for supernova will be another thing that, an, that a neutrino experiment can do in addition to its primary goals. It's the other physics that it's looking for. But HALO is a dedicated supernova detector um, using uh, different parts of other previously run experiments. So the, the tubes uh, behind me are the uh, uh, neutron detectors from the last phase of the original snow experiment and the lead is from a cosmic ray detector at uh, in chalk river ontario um so this is this is a cool detector that is dedicated just to looking for a supernova and is very uh durable in its runtime and uptime because if we don't know when a supernova will happen uh, we don't really have any prediction and we want to make sure all of our experiments are live and running and collecting data. So we want it to be very easy to run and to be very robust against um, any electronic hiccups or power weirdness. Uh, so Halo is really great for that. So that's something I didn't talk about earlier. And another cool... Um, so this is the, oh, <laughs> this is the cute detector, which is the, um, ah, there we go, cool. <laughs> uh, so this is the test facility for the super CDMS detector. So the super CDMS detector will be a, a very large cryostat. And this is a smaller cryostat to test some of the crystals as they come underground to get some initial uh, science results and to prototype uh, new detectors before they're put into uh, into the, the full facility after that is finished constructing. Super cool. So it's uh, it's kind of fun to move around the lab like this, a little less exercise. Yeah, we're, we're gonna do them all from now on. You'll just be like, oh, I'm here in the lab. And then, oh, I'm walking to this room, click really quick. You just need to tech support. Uh, Erica, this is awesome. If there's anything else you want to show us, you can certainly do it in Q&A as well or highlight it now. But what I think we'll do is we'll dive in with questions. And I'll start off with one of my own before we dive in with our teachers and for anyone on YouTube who might be joining in. Um, so this, the, the equipment that you've been showing looks really space age, like something you'd see in a sci-fi movie on board a spacecraft. Who designs all this? Like who makes this sort of equipment? How do they design it? And like, uh, you're talking about finding these elementary particles from across the universe. How sensitive is this equipment? Can you give us a sense of, you know, uh, an analogy of how, uh, what they're looking for in comparison to something that we might understand sort of more intuitively? Uh, yeah, so it's scientists and engineers that design the equipment. Um, so we have, we often start with smaller prototypes uh, and see how we have these ideas and we build a small detector to see if our idea even works. And then we make our next larger step after refining the process and to try to increase our sensitivity, maybe try out some new designs, realize things don't work and we have to do go in another direction. Um, so it's a long iterative process to, to get to where the detectors are that we see them in, this, in these pictures. Um, and even say the, the PICO experiment that I had just uh, uh, shown, they're, they're already planning for their next bigger step after, after the, the one that is currently being commissioned. Um, but the, they're designed by scientists and by engineers. So we have at Snow Lab, we have a large and growing engineering group to help the scientists um, make sure that, that we're taking into consideration everything we need to in terms of like weight loading and safety restrictions and uh, uh, electrical needs and 
every every possible thing you can need in these experiments. The engineers help us um, help us make sure we have we're thinking of everything and that the the experiments we want to build can can do uh, can achieve the physics goals that we're that we're setting out. Um, so a lot of the designing comes from that and from the scientists themselves. So we will first put the build the detector in in computer code and in simulation, and then um, make sure that that our computers tell us that they'll achieve the science we want to achieve, uh, and then that leads to our bigger design of actually building the things. Um, you mentioned how sensitive are the detectors, so. Yeah. Uh, there's actually one really good example for the snow detector. Um, we are, uh, it's the, let me, let me go back to that one. Uh, so I can be inside, inside the detector. Um, <laughs> swimming around, yes. We, except we would never be swimming. That's not safe underground. Oh, no. We would, <laughs> um, there was a, a point in measure in, during the run of the snow experiment where there was a little bit of extra radioactivity. So every I mentioned that everything in snow lab has to be clean. So we have to wash all of the mine dust off of us when we get into work. Um, anytime we touch anything, we have to wear gloves because just the sweat on our hands from the potassium forty inside our bodies will or the potassium forty from inside our bodies will eke out through the sweat in our hands. So we can't touch anything with our skin in our experiments. So we always have gloves in certain areas. We have two or three pairs of gloves that when we get into the area, we take off the outer set of gloves. Um, we, uh, so, so everything has to be very clean. Uh, for years, there was a weird radioactive blip in the experiment, just one area that was, uh, a little more hot, a little hotter, as we call it. Uh, you could see that events were being reconstructed, or we thought that there were a lot of events in this one location, um, and we didn't understand why. And then it was someone kind of put into the simulation. Well, what what if someone's hand touched this area? What if there was, you know, you look at how much potassium is in, you know, a, a few drops of sweat. Um, if if your hand just brushed across this area, could this be the reason for? this background and it turned out it was. So after we were spent some time cleaning the whole inside of this vessel uh, to, we, we had to scrub, scrub, scrub. And if you realize you have to think, oh, did my arm brush this area? We have to scrub, scrub, scrub again to try to remove that kind of background. Our photo sensor, our photo sensor so that's every little circle you see behind me, um, they are sensitive, to, sensitive enough to see a candle on the moon uh, from Earth. They can see single photons. They are incredibly, incredibly sensitive. Um, so we have to make sure that there is nothing, uh, no ambient bits of light inside the detector. So to take these pictures, we turn on these lights that are mounted, then we have to turn them off, and then we have to let the detector, all of the, the little photons kind of uh, cool off and, and uh, remove themselves before we can turn everything back on. Very cool. So this is a lesson for anyone in school. Like if you keep up with math, you get to go into the cryo pit and build like the coolest technology in the world. So just stay with it. Um, <laughs> awesome. Erica, that was great. I'm gonna go to Mr. Dupuy first. Uh, if you have a question from your class or on behalf of your class, uh, go for it. Yeah, I was gonna ask um, when the monitoring is being done, is there a single event that y'all are creating or is it something that's like a constant monitoring, monitoring of, of the environment? So we have constant monitoring of what's going on. We are um, we're taking data 24/7, 365. Even though we're not underground now, we have set it up so we had previously set it up so different control rooms at different universities could take data. Now we have it set up so that I mean for the Snow Plus experiment that you can even take data from your home that you can have all of the software on your own computer because we're all at home and and you know, this is part of. Uh, everyone working together to keep everyone safe. We're all at home, but we also want to keep doing keep doing science. So we've made it so that you can uh, monitor the detector from home. So we are constantly taking data. We're taking data at a rate. Our our trigger fires. We get an event in the detector about a thousand times a second. So our data data acquisition systems have to keep up with that rate. Now a lot of that isn't the event that we're looking for. 
uh, the, the neutrinos from the sun that we had been uh, looking for in our first phase happen about once a day. So that's the interaction rate of a solar neutrino inside the detector. So to have to sift through the you know, thousand events per second for a whole day to try and find the one neutrino event, that's the job of the data analysis groups. And to uh, clean the data, to know what the events are that are caused by other, other backgrounds, um, but we want to to remove them to try and find that one event is that's that's the challenge. But we also don't want to change our data taking thresholds to not look at all of those events because they're in the same energy range. And we um, we take as much data as we can and then do our best to filter everything out. And I want to stress something about neutrinos, especially because you're saying once a day this detector will capture neutrino, but just for context for people at home, if I hold my hand up, how many neutrinos are going through my hand every second, Erica? So with your thumbnail, thumbnail. neutrinos, solar neutrinos, neutrinos from the sun, but through your thumbnail, a uh, uh, hundred billion every second. <laughs> and so that many neutrinos and only one, like, so this is why we set up the facility is that they're so hard to capture and get a sense of and sort of take pictures of, so to speak, that it takes this device in such a unique location that much effort to capture one and yet a hundred billion are going through your thumbnail every second like it's, it's wild it's yes so, cool. so they interact uh only through the what we call the weak force but and those and they interact very 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 rarely so all of the other things that can create light in our detector happen much more frequently so that's why we use the two kilometers of earth to shield out all that other stuff so we can hopefully see just the neutrinos because the neutrinos don't even notice that they're going through the earth or not. It would take uh, a light year of lead to, to stop half of the neutrinos and the other half will keep going. Super cool. Um, all right, Ms. Fairweather, uh, joining us in Victoria. Do you have a question for us? Come on up. Yes, thank you. Um, that presentation was so thorough and engaging. I think the majority of the questions sent in to me by my kiddos are answered, <laughs> but I have two left. Um, one of them was, can you predict uh, where a supernova will take place or where and when? Yeah. We'll come um, to the second in a bit too, Ms. Fairweather. So we'll come to two questions for each teacher. Yeah, go for it, Erica. Okay, so there are some um, stars that we would expect to go nova before other stars, but in general, uh, no, we can't, we can't predict. And again, that's part of what makes it fun is to keep looking. Um, there, there are some models that say, or looking at stars, we think that they're at a certain point in their stellar evolution that they might go before other ones. So we can we can kind of keep an eye on those. Um, but no, it's, it's a big mystery, which is one of the things that makes it interesting to have uh, so many detectors that are sensitive to a supernova and in, in so many different locations and through so many different uh, channels, through different uh, neutrino interactions. So having, um, so there's actually a global network. This is a great question, thank you. Uh, a global network called SNOOZE for the supernova early warning system that if we have, that different neutrino detectors are tied in together, their data acquisition systems are um, linked up. So if the giant ice cube detector in the South Pole sees uh, a spike in their rate of events, and HALO sees a spike in their rate of events. And um, the uh, Camland detector in Japan, in, an, in, a, in a mine in Japan, um, sees a spike in their rate of events. And we all, uh, all of their data acquisition triggers are tied together. We think, hmm, what could possibly cause a spike in all of these events all over the world? Maybe, maybe it's a supernova. So, if we can then use the timing between when the detector in Canada, the detector in the South Pole and the detector in Japan all saw their, saw their events, we can tell astronomers where to point their telescopes to maybe see the event happening in real time. Because the neutrinos get to us faster than the light gets to us. Because the collapsing dense star is so massive, light is affected um, bent by the, the gravity um, and the electromagnetic uh, interactions inside the, inside the exploding star. But the neutrinos aren't affected by those electromagnetic re reactions. They just get right out because they're only 
uh, affected by what's called the weak force, and that's not the dominant force inside the collapsing star. So the light is kind of banging around inside, but the neutrinos get out of dodge, and they get to us first. So if we can see the neutrinos and point our telescopes, then maybe we can see the light coming. And we have never seen a uh, supernova exploding in real time. So that's one of the goals. In addition to then all the science we can do with the neutrinos that we see, in addition to um, having all of these telescopes to see in all of these different um, wavelengths what's happening in the supernova. You are crazy smart, Dr. Caden. We love it. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> all right. I'm going to go back to Mr. Dupuis for a second question. I'll come back to you, Ms. Fairweather, and share a few more, and we'll, we'll wrap up after that. So, Mr. Dupuis, go for it. Yeah, you may have answered it with that last question, but with the advance notice on the neutrino and a supernova, are there any other kind of like Nobel Prize moments, things that you're hoping for, wanting to, to be able to see? Um. So there's a lot of unanswered questions about the universe that we're still working on. Um, to really to detect dark matter, to nail down what is the, the particle, um, what, are, what is its interactions, uh, that, that is a, a giant unknown. So the main dark matter candidate particle that we're looking for at Snow Lab is just one model. And there's other experiments uh, all over the world looking for that model of particle, but there's also ones looking for other models. It is such an unknown, an unknown field um, that that would be, uh, I mean, start detecting dark matter, you know, con confirming that we've detected dark matter, that, that would be a Nobel Prize. Um, and it, which is very really interesting because it's different than the unknowns about the neutrino because we know so many of the properties. We know that the neutrino is very different than every other particle we have in this standard model of particle physics um, that explains 99.99999% of what we see, we, we understand. Um, but neutrinos don't follow the same rules that all of the other particles do, which makes them interesting and what makes us think that there may be a gateway to new physics. So the, the two experiments that I mentioned that are looking for this, um, if neutrinos and antineutrinos are the same thing, are the same kind of particle, are the same particle. Um, there's many, many experiments all over the world looking for that as well, but they all require these large detectors to be deep underground. Uh, so that's why we're trying to get the, the, next, the next one hosted here at Snow Lab um, to confirm that the, the neutrino is its own antiparticle, that there's lepton number violation, which is the, the science-y term for it. Um, that, would, that would probably be another Nobel Prize there. Fantastic. Nobel Prizes for all coming out of Snow Lab soon. And I like how you snuck in this cool different backdrop halfway between there. Well done. Um, all right, uh, Ms. Fairweather, do you have another question for us? Uh, second one, go for it. Yeah, um, it comes from um, Aaron in Division 19, um, but I'm going to reword it a little bit. I feel like it's very linked to kind of the whole idea of what it means to be a scientist in a way. And that's how do you maintain hope as well as funding um, without having found what you're looking for yet? Uh, all the equipment that you're using is probably pretty expensive. How do you go on um, maintaining that hope and funding? Great question. So those are two very good and very interesting, somewhat interrelated questions. I like that. Um, so how do we how do we maintain hope? <clears throat> um, the the existence of the neutrino was first postulated in 1930. It wasn't detected until 1956. So it's 26 years, longer than the lifetime of your students from when it was first, hmm, maybe, here's an idea. Maybe there's a particle that we can't detect that is coming off of this nuclear reaction. And that's what, that's why we're seeing the other uh, particle, the other decay products, the way that we're seeing them. Um, that was, that was a 19, in December of 1930, that was, that was the idea uh, that Wolfgang Pauli had. And it wasn't until 1956 that there was finally confirmation uh, from an experiment at a nuclear reactor in uh, South Carolina that 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 particle was really a particle, that, that the idea was correct, and that we have confirmation that neutrinos are a thing. So kind of looking back through history and seeing how long it takes to sometimes take an idea, a concept from idea to fruition, 
that that's part of what helps keep keeps me going is knowing that that we're playing the long game here and looking for uh and looking for these particles but also we're not just looking for particles part of the other thing that we that we get out of being scientists is developing technology so that's where some of the detectors come in and how we uh how we justify to funding agencies and to ourselves why this is worth spending you know millions of dollars on is that we're not just getting out science answers to science questions which is which is a good reason to do things um we're getting out we're developing technology so the world wide web was developed by particle physicists who wanted to share information and none of us would be able to focus uh, function right now without the internet, pretty much. Um, a lot of developments of cancer therapy and cancer treatments have been developed by particle phys physicists, proton therapy, um, uh, PET scanners. This is These are all developments that have come from physics. Um, the CCD cameras in your phone were used in telescopes for taking pictures. There, there are other applications, and those are just things that we've already figured out how to um, be interesting for in other in other areas. We don't know what other technology will come from the devices that we've developed to to do our science. And I think the other thing that we develop is scientists. We develop people with these, uh, with the skills and the the knowledge and the computational skills to look at things in a different way, and to to use the the techniques that we use in data analysis on these giant uh, global data sets for for other fields. Um, yeah, I, th <laughs> I think that's, um, yeah. I, there's many things that you can use our scientific skills to improve the world in different ways. Um, and that's one of the, the things that we like to, that we really like to highlight is all of the scientists that we've trained and all of the great areas and great developments that they've had in other fields that maybe aren't physics. Um, it can be, uh, there. <clears throat> there's many, many opportunities to, to be a physicist that isn't academia or in an, under, in an underground. Yep. Uh, Erica, uh, Ms. Fairweather's question was like, it was earnest and, and from a child, but it's a question that I know can be a pointed one in, in various circumstances. And that's like a mic drop answer. Like that was awesome. Um, <laughs> couldn't do it better by myself. And it's something that we cover in a lot of our, our presentations. And I, and I love this idea that science for its own sake is worth every penny. Um, but beyond that, things that people would never otherwise expect to come from science do. I mean, assessing the bacterial uh, immune system has led to CRISPR for genetics. And when we covered genetics topics, that's the biggest development in a hundred years. And it came about by looking at the immune system. Uh, all our computers, television, all these things, phones, internet, uh, are all based on information theory, which is the most obscure and esoteric branch of science imaginable, you know, 70 years ago. And so, Again, for, for pure scientific value, for understanding the universe around us and for the things that come about because of it, I think that's a beautiful answer. And I couldn't think of a better way to wrap up. Um, before we do, Dr. Caden, is there any last message you wanna share for kids about how they can find out more about Snow Lab and the work that you do directly? So on all of the different social media platforms, what have you, we are at Snow Lab Science. Um, uh, I, there is one, uh, one other thing I wanna talk about a little bit is uh, the scientists uh, kind of around the world, particle physicists, starting with a group in Italy, have been working on a ventilator because we, we study gas systems. We have lots of different high pressure um, gas systems in our detectors. So they took that knowledge in, in today's world and in, in the pandemic that we have is to, to see what, what can we do to help. Um, so they helped to design a ventilator and with working with teams in Canada and teams in the United States that has now just been uh, approved by the FDA for use. So this is just to help help people breathe during this. And that is another another use of our scientific knowledge and our engineering experience um, that we have hopefully been able to help people. Uh, Snow Lab donated a ton of our PPE, our, our clean suits and our gloves uh, to our local, uh, our local hospital at Health Sciences North. Um, that we have been so fortunate in to have this lab here, to have this facility, to bring people to the North to do science that we wanted to give back to our community. So there's, uh, it, science is not done by one person sitting in their lab. It's done by communities now. And we're very, 
uh, happy and proud to be part of our local community. Beautiful. I, I honestly, this couldn't have ended better if I tried. Uh, so <laughs> Dr. Caden, thank you so much for a lovely presentation today. Uh, for both our teachers, I have linked at Snow Lab Science and the Snow Lab website, which is just snowlab.ca into the chat bar. You can check that out for two, those tuning in on YouTube as well. And what we do at the end of every session for our teachers who are, who are new to this today, uh, Mr. Dupuis, Miss Fairweather, if you could join me in saying a huge thank you to Erica for joining us today. You were both demuted. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Yes, thank you. Billions of neutrinos worth. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. Uh, for everyone tuning in on YouTube, have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you all soon, and bye for now.